All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the Apocrypha. Um, several of you in past uh, lectures, occasionally we come to a place where we talk about the Apocrypha and then people ask about it and they say, what is that? And we say, well, someday we'll do a lecture on that. <laughs> and so here it is. Um, what is the Apocrypha? So the word here actually comes to us in the, in the West in English through medieval Latin. So the word Apocryphus, you know, is a, um, Adjective, so apocryphusa um, so the a uh, is for feminine. It means hidden, and that co is coming you know, directly from the Greek word apocryphos, which means obscure, and that is in turn related to a Greek verb that means to hide. So anyway, the idea that as people have taken it is there's this idea that this is a hidden book, <laughs> or hidden books, and that is always great for a title. If you can have a title of your book be secrets of this or that, or the nine secrets of successful people or nine, nine secrets to eternal life that they kept out of the Bible for some reason, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. <laughs> the problem with the title is that the Apocrypha really have never actually been hidden. So there are a bunch of books of the Bible that are, um, let's say, lost books of the Bible, and we've done a couple of those before and we'll do more again where we do, um, let's say, lost books of either the Hebrew Bible or the Christian New Testament. Um, these nevertheless, um, have always been pretty available, <laughs> and including that even, um, even though they're not in the Protestant Bible in the proper canon, nevertheless, for example, in English, the King James scholars actually did go through it and translate them all into English, so they've been quite available um, you know, in the English-speaking world as long as printing has, so nobody's had to worry too much about where they were. All right, <laughs> so what are the books? Uh, I was gonna try to make icons to do this. There's too many of them to all fit as little icons on here. Um, and I've just kind of made a little chart to kind of explain how these go in some of the basic canons. There's multiple canons as we've seen in the past in both in Judeo-Christianity, um, but I'm just gonna have here different columns here for the Catholic canon, the Greek Orthodox canon, the Old Church Slavonic canon, which is like the Russian Orthodox Church, Protestant canons, and then Jewish canon. And so of these books, Tobit, Judith, Additions to Esther, Wisdom of Solomon, uh, the book called Ecclesiasticus as opposed to Ecclesiastes, sometimes also called Sirach, uh, Baruch, the letter of Jeremiah, additions to the book of Daniel, 1st, 2nd Maccabees, 1st Esdras, confusingly sometimes called 3rd Esdras, <laughs> sometimes also called 4th Esdras, the prayer of Manasseh, Psalm 151, so one more psalm in case you didn't like the first one, I mean in case you really liked the one for, first 150 of them and you need another one, here's another one. <laughs> Uh, third Maccabees, more Maccabees, <laughs> second Esdras, some more Esdras, and uh, fourth Maccabees. And so we can kind of see here then within the canons, um, none of them are in the Hebrew Bible or in the Jewish canon as put together by the rabbis. So these are all not in the, in the canon of the proper canon of Hebrew scriptures. For the Catholics, all the way up here through this first set of them, and then I have these little stars here because they're in an appendix. <laughs> So they're kind of still in the Bible, but then there's kind of without it being canonical or something like that. And that happens again for the Greeks who have in a little appendix. The Russians don't have that, but they have more of the books than anybody. So only poor fourth Maccabees isn't making it in into anybody's actual canon, although it is in an appendix. And then finally, the Protestants have the whole thing that they have, which is to say the same ones that the Catholics have at all in their appendix, right? <laughs> So essentially, nobody has really necessarily got rid of them all, but they are not all canonized, although for some of the denominations, they are canonical. Um, obviously, we've talked before, for example, with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has almost all of this and then a bunch more books too. So there are also canons that are bigger than this, but I'm just pointing these out as kind of the main ones. So we know very well, um, you know, from all of our different lectures that we've had on this and our studies that we have on this, that the Old Testament, that the Hebrew Bible, as it's called, is not simply something that somebody wrote from start to finish or composed from start to finish or um, was delivered directly by the hand of God out of, the, out, of, um, out of a cloud at one moment. Rather, it was over the course of a very long period of time, multiple authors in different languages composed different texts, none of whom they largely ever imagined were gonna be compiled together as one book of scripture at all, uh, but ultimately all did get published together, and so it is always all read um, 
in a way that none of its authors intended for it to be read, right? And in addition to the ones that made it in, <laughs> there was a lot more of them <laughs> that didn't make it in. So it's a complicated um, pattern of different books that might have made it into different canons, and some of them did and some of them didn't. So um, we'll zoom in, not spend a huge amount of time on this, but this is kind of a timeline of the kind of Bible, biblical text-making period. So, so we're counting down before the Common Era, so that's you know, BC, as we often call it, and then the Common Era, or AD, as it's usually called. Um, we say it that way because we're in Judeo-Christianity, and so, you know, if we're, it's not, anyways, if we say the Christian era and before the Christian era, nobody likes it. It wants to make it inclusive, right? So before this era, um, essentially there's the, in the, in the main states of uh, the biblical lands, uh, there is this period of time then in the first temple period that we have missing, um, but essentially then the destruction of the northern and southern kingdoms, the destruction of Jerusalem. There's this period called the Babylonian captivity, which we're zooming in on in this particular timeline. So this is the time period when the elite uh, members of the people in Jerusalem, so the Judeans or Jews who are uh, the leaders, um, are either in exile in Egypt or they've been taken into exile in Babylon. Uh, when the Babylonian Empire is conquered by the Persian Empire, uh, the Persian uh, emperor lets uh, the people go back to Jerusalem. Those elites go back if they want to. Not all of them go. Uh, and it becomes then a Persian province with capital as Jerusalem, the province of Yehud. And so there's this Persian period. Then what ends up happening is Alexander the Great uh, destroys the Persian Empire, conquers it, it gets split up between his generals. His generals include Ptolemy, who uh, leads Egypt. And so immediately, um, this land, Yehud, is now in the, or Judea as it comes to be called, it's now in Greek. And so Yehud in Persian, Judea in Greek. It's now in the control of the Egyptian Empire, the Ptolemaic Empire. There's a question. <laughs> uh, I heard on the radio many year, a few years ago that Alexander the Great this is probably a rumor, was poisoned by his right-hand man, his best friend, uh -huh. whom I forget what the name was. What, do you know who it is? And if, was that guy given uh, any do, uh, jurisdiction over any of these um, communities? And so I have to, you know, it's been a long time since I've done it. What I think is the, the case with um, Alexander is, is I think he's largely thought to have been, to have died of an illness. But on the other hand, when anybody dies young, they, get, they also, there's accusations of poisoning. And so um, certainly all of his generals fight really quick. His, 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 his family uh, does get killed and in, in, in isn't making it into being into a succession. So it doesn't go to his son or something like that in the minority. But I'm going to have to do a lecture on Alexander and we'll, we'll research it and make sure we know. Well, I just wanted to know who his right-hand man is, the one he trusted the most, yeah. whatever the name. I just can't remember. But so, he had so all his uh, trust in this one guy. Okay. Yeah. Well. So yeah. So it's not. Yeah. So yeah. His best friend was named. Um, his, yeah. His right hand Hephaist, man. Hephaestion, is it? Something like that. Hephaestion. And so Hephaestion had already died, and then and then he had generals. And so his generals include Antigonus, uh, Seleucus, and um, and Ptolemy. And so and so Tol and Essentially, what happens is as soon as he dies, those guys all run in four different directions, so that they can take over whatever they can. Ptolemy, being the smartest one, I think, ran to Egypt. <laughs> And became Pharaoh, and so then Ptolemy, you know, had it created a dynasty that lasted to Cleopatra. So Cleopatra is the last of the Ptolemies. Anyway, so at first that Ptolemaic Egypt, Greek Egypt, Hellenistic Egypt, controls Judea, you know, this province of Jerusalem. Then they lose it to the Seleucids, who are the people that are ruling Syria, and uh, and then there is a, a revolt where there is this Hasmonean. Kingdom, which is sometimes called the Maccabees. We sort of, there's the Book of Maccabees. Uh, and that's where there's a brief independent uh, Jewish kingdom. And then the Romans come in and take it over, and it's Roman until, uh, until the Muslim conquest. So, anyway, in this time period, then, the kind of the major Bible, uh, early Bible editing and composing of the earliest books of the Bible are all being compiled down here when the uh, Babylonian captivity ends. And when Ezra is starting to rebuild the temple, all the things are kind of coming together at that point. 
but there continued to be texts <laughs> written after uh, the last of the Bible texts, or the last of the biblical period ends, and before, for Christians, New Testament period begins, right? And so, in fact, even, um, where is it on here? The, uh, the book of Daniel is actually written all the way here, even though it pretends to be written here, and so it did make it in. Under the normal rules of the canon, that should have also been excluded because essentially all the books that are in this intertestamentary period, um, they're kind of keeping out. But it doesn't mean that um, they're stopped being prophets. It doesn't mean that they're stopped being writers of Bible-like books. In fact, it accelerated a lot, and there's way more. And so what there did start to be is more doorkeepers to keep them all out, and that's what ends up happening. Okay, so uh, one of the things when we're looking at uh, kind of these texts is to we kind of remember that there is always a tension when you are in a place uh, where Judea is uh, in Palestine. It's a zone that is essentially a smallish zone that's on the frontier between two larger imperial zones, the imperial zones of Iraq, Mesopotamia, and of Egypt, which are always going to be the bigger powers on either side of you that try to fight over it. And so as a result of that, there is always kind of essentially a, um, a, a they're also influencing you culturally. And so uh, when that destruction happened, we had exile groups that went both places. So we always think of the Babylonian captivity, but lots and lots of other uh, Judeans fled into Egypt, including the prophet Jeremiah. And even in Egypt, they build a temple. And so there is a temple of Israelite worship in Egypt then, even though technically, according to the law, you're not supposed to build any temples other than in Jerusalem. Then later, uh, when there, we have that second temple period, when the, uh, when the um, Judeans go back and rebuild the Jerusalem temple and they compile the Bible, they're doing all this Bible editing and everything like that, there is a bunch of Egyptian and later Hellenistic ideas that are coming into the second temple period, but there's also Persian and Mesopotamian ideas happening, right? So in the first part of that period then, <laughs> Yeah, the Persian Empire. So the first great world empire, um, of which, again, it's usually people don't start to think about this, but that entire period from Ezra, that second temple period, Jerusalem and Yehud are really just a little province around Jerusalem that are a province of the Persian Empire. And so Ezra is an official of the Persian Empire. And so it's still, you know, in other words, there's a lot of Persian influence that's happening uh, in this time period, and indeed the book of Ezra calls um, Cyrus uh, a messiah. So because he has done this thing, he is, uh, because he's a, been essentially acted as an um, anointed king and brought the people back and helped rebuild the temple, he is a messiah. So there's a sense of that. So during this time period, if we're going to show these kind of different things, the Persians' ideas are really winning out uh, because of all of that influence of that empire. And so there's a large diaspora community, so in other words, an exile community. So at, from the time period, from the destruction of Jerusalem on, there are as many, generally as many probably Jews, Judeans and Jews who are observant outside of the land of Judea as there are inside it. Um, and so there are a lot of them in Egypt. And although that continues to be the case, the return of the Babylonian exiles to Jerusalem and the others uh, at the orders of the Persian emperor and the rebuilding of the new temple in the Persian province of Yehud meant that Babylonian and Persian influences are more dominant at the beginning of this period, the second temple period. Okay, then we mentioned Alexander, right? So Alexander the Great upends the whole situation and the resulting successor empires. So we mentioned the Seleucids here in Syria, but originally also in Iraq and Persia, the Ptolemies in Egypt, and then the other guys who have much less space, but anyway, uh, back in Greece and in the heartland of Macedonia and things like that. So in this case, when that happened, obviously it reversed itself again, because now um, Hellenistic influences are very dominant all over the region. Um, this, uh, Alexander founds this great city of Alexandria. Alexandria is a place of uh, vast learning and scholarship. And one of the things that Ptolemy does in creating uh, the library at Alexandria uh, is set in motion um, an idea that they want to have all learning everywhere. And this includes then all of this writing that the Judeans have had. And so they want that to come to the library of Alexandria. But as such, it has to be in the universal language that 
uh, everybody sh uh, civilized people use, which is Greek. <laughs> and so that's the idea of it, right? So um, uh, onto the Ptolemies then. Uh, uh, Alexandria is the largest city in the Hellenistic world. It's the center of Greek teaching. The Judean community in Alexandria becomes the largest Judean community in the world. So there's a vast Jewish community in this big city, cosmopolitan city of Alexandria. And then these Alexandrian Jews um, create what's called the Septuagint, translation of the Hebrew Bible around the third century BCE. And so this is really important because before this, all these little books are just little books. <laughs> you know, so they are not all in a collection. There's no such thing as a canon. And there's a vast number of these books and you don't have anybody who is got a stamper that says this one yes, this one no. Any individual person can do that, but there's no um, central leader that is able to speak for everybody that has done that. And so the very first time that everybody decides to what's gonna get included or not is whether it was worth translating or not. <laughs> and so now uh, the Septuagint, Septuagint then creates the first kind of canon collection, even if it's not you know, it's not necessarily official, but people have essentially, what they translated is what you get. And so in this case, um, what we end up having is, uh, it's called the 70, but probably, the, the magic number is probably 72. Uh, so it's by, according to myth, it's 72 scholars who translated it all, and each one of them, you know, is in their own different little room, and they all translated it exactly the same. So you know that it's a divine translation. Um, but anyway, that's a later myth or understanding of how it happens. It does, um, it is kind of, uh, anyway, it all happens and it's an important thing to have happened. They take, um, you know, the five books attributed to Moses, so the law, they take the entire Deuteronomic history and other history texts which they organize as history, they take wisdom writings, and finally they take prophetic writings, and they organize them into these categories. And so this includes this larger number of books that includes that I mentioned Maccabees, Maccabees, you know, these kind of things, which eventually all make it into the Septuagint. Obviously not all of these are written at the time when the Septuagint starts, but as, as a, as a, after they are written or added uh, in, the, in the BCE era, that becomes the Septuagint corpus. So that's the Septuagint. <laughs> But remember always, there's way more of these books you know, that are not making it in, that they didn't translate. So, and, and a lot of these books are considered scripture, for example, by the, by the Essenes that are over at Qumran and that are having this uh, monastery by the Dead Sea. And so there's all of the Dead Sea Scrolls include lots of these books that they're doing commentaries on as if they were scripture, even though they're not making it into either the Septuagint or the rabbinic uh, uh, books. We need to get the microphone. How are you doing? <laughs> yep. Did Mike, did the answer turn this off? Uh, I don't know which, try again. Nope. No, try again. Um. Yeah. Who was the editor? Who was the head of the translation? Who gave the money for all the translation? So according to, the, according to that legend that I talked about, it's in fact, uh, I think the very first Ptolemy, so Ptolemy Soter is, the, is supposedly, you know, as he's trying to assemble all of the books of all learning in all the world, he determined that this is also worth doing and so that he put the money up. Um, I think it's not clear that that's true. You know, so that's according to a later apocryphal book that made it into the Septuagint, <laughs> but it's probably not a historic book, and I think most scholars don't agree that that's what, that's what happened. And so probably it is the community there, uh, the Jewish community in Alexandria, that is desirous of having these texts included in the library and everything like that, so they are probably self-funding it. Um, but anyway, according to the legend, it is the king, the, the pharaoh. GoFundMe. Yeah, it was a GoFundMe site and very successful one. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned anyway, I already just said, many then first century Hellenistic Jews in the diaspora, so again, the people who aren't living in the land, people to Jewish communities that are in all the Greek speaking cities of the Eastern Hellenistic empires and everything like that uh, of the Mediterranean, they um, actually did not know Hebrew. 
and actually even in the land of uh, Judea, they're almost all now speaking Aramaic, which is a related language, but anyway, is the language that is being spoken as the lingua franca of the uh, Persian Empire. So it's the language of, of Syria and some of Iraq. Um, so uh, anyway, they wouldn't have known Hebrew, and they're using then the Septuagint as their scriptures. So they will use their access to scriptures in Greek. Uh, and even in the Aramaic-speaking Judea, some Jews considered some of these texts canon. And so I mentioned that several of these, like Tobit, Sirach, the Epistle of Jeremiah, so these are books that are included in this apocryphal list but are not, for example, now in the Jewish canon. Those are among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the people at Qumran are looking to these as, this, as if they're part of that same biblical corpus. What is deuterocanonicus? Oh yeah, so I have now failed to introduce that word. <laughs> So, so I mentioned how there's a medieval name for this is Apocrypha, um, you know, coming out of the medieval Latin, and I was saying that that means hidden books, uh, but not for everybody are they hidden at all, because for some people, as we saw, uh, most of the books in the ca are in the Catholic canon, uh, and so this is a way of saying, so the canon and Deutero, <laughs> right, and so in the same way that we maybe have um, if you remember in the, out of the Pentateuch, one of the, the last book of the five books of Moses is called Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. which means Deuteronomy, <laughs> which is to say law. So it means second law. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that the first four books are the law of Moses and now the Deuteronomy is the second law, um, and this, this is the second canon. So it's not, they're more or less asserting that you could have all the rest of the books in the canon, and that's the canon, but these are also canonical and it's, Good to have these too. You know, you can do, you maybe do without them, but anyway, they're also part of it. So the deuterocanonic, deuterocanonical books. So also, um, just going back then to uh, the Second Temple period, um, the early Christians who initially all come out of uh, Second Temple Judaism, they're all initially observant Jews, they also quote, when I ever write this, LXX, that means 70 in Latin, right? So that means the Septuagint, so the 70. So they also quote the Septuagint, uh, and they consider that to be scripture. So um, the Christian Bible, the New Testament, is all written originally in Greek. So none of the Gospels, none of the letters, none of the books that have made it, the Apocalypses that are in the New Testament are written first in Aramaic or in Hebrew and then translated into Greek. They're all written in Greek, and that's important because even, even though the earliest Christians, anyway, the earliest people that are in the Jesus movement, Jesus himself, their, their um, language would have been uh, Aramaic, uh, which is the common language of the people at the time. It's related to Hebrew, but it's a little bit different, right? Or it's actually quite different. It's a different language, but it's, you can kind of get it, I guess, if you speak Hebrew. Um, Anyway, and so this is uh, what they have then, is when we, are, when we are in a New Testament text, and let's say Jesus or Paul or somebody um, quotes a Hebrew Bible text, they aren't going back to that original Hebrew as if they had a Hebrew school or they memorized it, and now, let's say the author of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John translates that anew into Greek. They are just going straight to the Septuagint. <laughs> and so they'll just say it word for word out of the Septuagint. And so the idea here is, is that we are not having then um, some kind of word-for-word -word transcript of, let's say, Jesus giving a sermon, because that would have been in Aramaic. Rather, we are having multi-decades later compositions of Greek literary writers who, when they quote you know, this canon, they're using the Greek. And so it's very important for Christianity. Yes, question, Catherine. So you're saying when in the New Testament, when Jesus is quoting what we modernly refer to as the Old Testament, yes, it's not it's not that they have a quote and they say, "Oh, hey, this matches." They go and they copy the original quote. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, or, <laughs> or what? I mean, so that's definitely what Matthew and Luke do. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, you know, a lot of times ancient people do have um, the texts memorized. Uh, and so we, uh, we don't have this at all because everything is very available to us. We can Google everything and look at it. So we very, very little is memorized of a thing. But in antiquity, people had um, much fewer, many fewer texts and, um, and people really uh, memorized text a lot. And so, because you only had access to a few of them. And so Mark, um, who, 
doesn't know the text very well. And so Mark will often quote the Old Testament from the Septuagint, but get it wrong. <laughs> so, so that also happens. And so then what will happen is if Mark is misquoting, having Jesus misquote the Old Testament, then when Luke and Matthew, who take Mark's text and fix it, they'll just silently fix it. And nothing, no problem, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, and so anyway, that does happen. Yes, Elizabeth. Maybe out of the scope of this lecture, but at some point, Jews started to go back to the Hebrew. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, when? we'll talk about it. Yeah. You will. Like. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So we're just making the point here that for the, the Christian community or the Jewish community that becomes Christian, they are really over on the Greek side of that tension that we talked about. So in other words, we talked about how there's a kind of a Aramaic or Babylonian tension on the one side and a Greek and Egyptian side. The Christians really are over in Egypt land, <laughs> you know, in terms of this side of the scale. Um, and so then the 70 then is the basis then of the Christian canon. So when, uh, when Christianity then emerges as in its own religion, it starts putting its own canon together. You know, they take the Septuagint, again, that's what this means here, that original um, Jewish version of the, of the text. If you end up being the Greek Orthodox Church, you just get to keep it. <laughs> you don't have to translate anything. So now that becomes the canon. And in fact, um, to this day, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church just considers this to be preferable to any new translation from the Hebrew, because this is what, this is what the canon is. Uh, meanwhile, uh, not everybody stayed and keep, kept being speaking Greek. The whole Eastern, I'm sorry, Western half of the empire, the Roman Empire, of course, spoke Latin, and so it was essential for the Western half to get it into Latin, and so the kind of Latin that it got translated into is called vulgar Latin. <laughs> <laughs> vulgar is just one of the many words for means common, right? So you can tell that the people who used to write, you know, the, the elites didn't like the masses because they called them peons and all the other things. Anyway, so the vulgar, the way the vulgar people speak or common tongue Latin, and so then that becomes the Vulgate, and so that's why that's called the Vulgate. Anyway, so St. Jerome, a uh, great scholar, uh, translated it all. Yeah, there's a question here or a comment. Thank you. Um, the fact that Jerome said that some books were not originally Hebrew, yes, right. were there quite a many, quite a few, or very limited? Or if they were just limited, what, which, which ones would they have been? You were anticipating where we're going. Oh. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so Jerome points out Thank in doing that, like you say, you're, you're, you're getting to where we're going. We'll tell you which ones they are. So Jerome points out that just a few of these books don't have Hebrew originals. And so that's a, he puts that as an important note as he's translating the Latin, because he, sa he says, or at least he claims, that he went back to the Hebrew to make the translation into the Vulgate. Not everybody believes him, because <laughs> a lot of people don't think Jerome's Hebrew is that good. Um, yeah. but, and he does seem to follow Septuagint a lot, but at least he's able to tell where there is no Hebrew um, in original to go back to. And so ultimately then, uh, because of that, some of them he puts them into these appendices and some of them don't make it in to the Latin ones. We saw there's a little bit of difference between the Catholic canon essentially and the Orthodox canon and this is why that happens. So we'll get to exactly which ones those are. But in the meantime, we're going to do Elizabeth's question first, <laughs> which is, um, so what happened in terms of Rabbinic Judaism? So Rabbinic Judaism ultimately decides that this whole Greek thing has ended in a disaster <laughs> because look what happened, Christians. <laughs> this is not what anybody wanted, right? You know, so everybody who um, continued to be non-Messianic Jews, in other words, who continued to not or not Christian, yeah, not Jesus Messiah Jews, um, they all have kind of decided that this boy, these guys really took this the wrong way. <laughs> They've injected all this Greek stuff into uh, the religion. And so there was a real desire to purge all this kind of Greek stuff away. And so actually to stop studying, um, say even Greek speaking uh, Jewish authors. So these authors from Alexandria like Philo and Josephus that are preserved only in the Christian tradition, even though they're entirely Jewish uh, philosophers and writers, um, they are not preserved in the Jewish tradition because, again, they are seemed as a, a jumping off point for this terrible, disastrous heresy that happens with Christianity from the Jewish perspective. So when they reassemble their canon, the rabbis eliminate most of the texts written in the later temple period. And I mentioned an exception is Daniel because they don't realize that it was written as late as it was. So we end up with the Hebrew canon then being a much smaller collection of texts than what we had in the, um, in the Septuagint. And these are 
called by an acronym, the Tanakh. And so that's coming from Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, which is to say the law, the prophets, and the writings. And this is why then the Hebrew Bible in the Jewish canon is in a different order than all the Christian canons, because the Christian canons are in that earlier Septuagint order, but now they're grouped in a new way um, by the rabbis here. So we have Torah, the five books attributed to Moses, you know, and then um, uh, the prophets lumped together, but including things like all the minor prophets are one book. So that's including everybody like Jonah and everybody that's all in one book, right? And uh, and kings, in other words, the earlier ones, kings, Samuel, Joshua, and judges are count, counted as prophets. And then the additional writings includes those wisdom writings that made it in, as well as things like Psalms, the biggest one of the, the writings. Okay. So <clears throat> just to kind of bring it to um, then, you know, where we're getting it, you know, getting it to in the West, uh, the Protestants then decided to reject the deuterocanonical books. So at the time of the Reformation, Protestants are emphasizing translating the Bible into their own vernacular languages now. So Latin has ceased to be the universal tongue as far as everybody's concerned in the West. Now people are speaking Shakespearean English or uh, that equivalent of that in French, <laughs> you know, and German and all that sort of thing, and so uh, in Dutch. And so the Protestants then want to translate the Bible into those languages so that every person can have access to it directly and not have to um, have it mediated through the priests who are the ones that know Latin. When they do that then, they also get the bright idea that they want to go back and go to the original Hebrew rather than translating from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to English to think, well, that's going to make for a bad kind of telephone game of getting the actual content right. So instead, they want to go back to the Hebrew. And when they do that, then they also notice that a bunch of these books aren't written originally in Hebrew. Uh, unfortunately for the King James scholars, um, one of the things that they end up doing is, especially in the Greek, so especially in the New Testament, they go back to an original Greek instead of translating from the Latin to English, but they get a bad Greek copy. <laughs> And so, and so the problem, and so therefore, that's one of the reasons why the King James Bible um, is, while beautiful, le less accurate uh, in terms of a translation. It's because it's not because they aren't good translators. It's because they, the text that they had that they're translating from is not as good. So now we have the, we've subsequently created the discipline of literary criticism. We subsequently gathered all. Um, um, all manuscripts of the Bible from everywhere. And so now we know um, what the most original version of the original text is. You could have a very bad copy of a multiply um, with all kinds of insertions and errors you know, that's in Hebrew <laughs> to translate from, and that's not gonna give you a good translation. You wanna get the earliest and most correct Hebrew before you translate it into English, right? So that's what's happened in the newer translations. Okay. So what we end up with then is we're just kind of, you know, a big picture on all this. We were talking here about then in ancient Israel, um, even in the first temple period, uh, there are factions within the court that are being drawn and who want to make alliances either the one direction with the big power of Egypt or the other direction, the big power of Babylon. Um, and then when we're getting to the, um, how the Bible is influenced and things like that, it, that ends up with these, again, these two splits the sort of Greek and Egyptian West split, the uh, Aramaic and Babylonian East split. And this ends up being the Catholic and Orthodox canon, and this is the Protestant and Jewish canon. So again, this is just another way to show that same thing. So we have kind of a weird divide in terms of if you have the Apocrypha or you don't, and, uh, or you do or don't, and so again, Protestants are with the Jews on this one, and Orthodox and Catholics are together on this. So just a reminder, <laughs> so to your point, which are the ones that don't make it in, you know, and don't have the originals? Um, it's a special, well, we'll go through individual ones, but it's essentially, these are the ones that have notes about them. So the, that about Psalm 151 that nobody took. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Psalm 151, is, neither the Catholics or the Protestants took that. What was the problem with that? Well, so again, it's late and it's not attested in any of the earliest uh, versions of the Psalms. So it's definitely an additional poem that someone has written later. They've written it as though David wrote it. Uh, it's not really written by David, and so then, but it got attached onto the end of the Psalms. And so for people that 
most of the psalms that are attributed to David are not written by David, or possibly any of them. But they would be in his style? They would be in the style, hopefully, of the ones that are attributed to David in the, in the text. Um, but in any event, uh, for a lot of people, they had good reasons why they thought, well, these, these last ones, they aren't in the earliest manuscripts. It, we, can't, uh, we can't justify putting it in. So that's why. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to look at some of these. I don't have, I'm not going to, I'm, we can't, because of the timing and because of what, you know, how much of Apocrypha it turns out there is, I can only, you know, I'm going to highlight a few of these, and unfortunately one of them is not going to be the song, uh, but I'm going to, am going to bring out, I think, about five of these and give you a sense of what these books are, because I think that they're actually a lot of very interesting books, and we don't hear about them as much anymore as uh, they did in the past, maybe. So Tobit is one of them. Um, so this is an adventure story about a guy named Tobit and especially his son Tobias or Tobiah in, in Hebrew, Tobias in Greek. It's set in the 8th century BCE, so way back in the first temple period, but it's composed uh, in the 2nd and 3rd century BCE, so in the heart of that second temple period. Um, it's composed either in Aramaic or in Hebrew. Um, a lot of people think Aramaic, but then there is a he some Hebrew fragments of it in the, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scroll community had uh, copies or fragments of Tobit, and they have Hebrew and Aramaic versions, and so it's possible, though, um, a lot of times what ends up happening is that people translate things into Hebrew. And so even sometimes where there's a Greek original, they'll sometimes translate it into Hebrew. And so it is a little bit of a puzzle for linguists. They have to kind of say um, that this really betrays a, you know, like a Hebrew origin and it has all these Hebrewisms in the Greek. But the problem with that is, is that also what can happen is because the whole Septuagint is translated from Hebrew largely um, and so therefore has Hebrewisms in it, if you're trying to imitate that style, you also do that. So it becomes a big trick for linguists to figure it out, but so they try to puzzle it out, and that's why we don't always know the answer. So the author is unknown, but it's clearly a Jewish author that is somewhere in the diaspora. So it's somebody who is really concerned about and is aware of people who are living in the exile communities uh, all around, whether it's in Mesopotamia, whether it's in Egypt, it's not clear. But um, anyway, the author is in one of these places, not living in the land, because he's really concerned about the diaspora, um, uh, the diaspora people. So, um, <laughs> so they actually inspired lots of artwork in the Renaissance. <laughs> so um, this is actually the only canonical source for the characters of Raphael the Archangel, and so people like the painter Raphael, who are named for that Archangel, that character appears only in uh, Tobit in terms of that canon that we have. And also Asmodeus the demon, or Asmodeus, if you ever have heard of Asmodeus, I don't know, you might not have. Okay, well, so that's where he, this is where he comes from, from Tobit. So let's look at the plot of this story. So Tobit is a righteous Israelite. Uh, I think he's from the tribe of Naphtali, so one of the northern tribes. And he is living in the diaspora in Nineveh. So if you may remember the lost 10 tribes, the northern tribes are carted off to Assyria, the same way that the uh, tribes of Judah and Benjamin are carted off to uh, Babylon. And so essentially this is set. Again, this is not actually about this time, but it's set in that time of uh, the northern people. And, and while he's there, he just suffers loss after loss after loss. So he loses all his property. Um, He's very righteous, he does everything righteous, he doesn't deserve all these things that happen to him. And finally, as he's um, uh, uh, having one last struggle, he's making his way back to his home in Nineveh. He has to sleep out on the, he's sleeping out without a tent or anything like that. Bird droppings in his, land in his eyes and that blinds him. And so he really gets to the point where he has been this long-suffering guy like Job. But unlike Job, uh, who everybody tells to curse God and die, you know, <laughs> and he just perseveres. Um, Tobit's like, praise for God, to God that he can just be allowed to die, <laughs> you know, so he's done. Um, and so one of the things that happens in the whole course of this is it gives us all kinds of insights into the customs uh, and how uh, Jews in the diaspora are trying to uh, be observing their religion when they don't, when they aren't around the temple in Jerusalem and they don't have access to that. And so it's very interesting for that as there's all kinds of little details that pop up in this book. So meanwhile, so after we leave Tobit behind, you know, we flash to a completely interlaced scene 
you know, way off in media, which is to say um, the precursor of Persia, the part of the Persian Empire, but before the Persian Empire. In media, there's a young woman named Sarah. She's, of course, gorgeous, as they always are, and also super righteous. And she is also an Israelite in the diaspora. She's lamenting because she keeps getting married. <laughs> So she keeps finding, of course, she's beautiful. Everybody wants to marry her. But after she marries uh, a young man, it goes back to uh, the bedchamber. And they're going to have their uh, um, honeymoon night or wedding night. Uh, and then the demon Asmodeus comes and just kills the guy dead. And this has now happened seven times. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at the very same moment that Tobit is praying to die uh, to God to let him die, she, uh, uh, Sarah here is ha having the very same prayer. She wants to just die already because she, you know, what's the use of being the most beautiful, righteous Israelite girl in the universe if every time you try to marry one of these <laughs> guys or rich guys or whatever, Asmodeus just kills them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so anyway. And then the other thing that's happened is that everyone's accusing her of being a black widow, right? So she's the one who's obviously killing all these boys. Uh, and so that's, <coughs> anyway, her fate. Okay. So meanwhile, <coughs> Tobit remembers, wait a second, you know, um, I'm broke and blind and have all this thing happen to me, but I remember that I had this friend that I like lent all this money to, or, you know, not lent, but anyway, had put all this money in trust with, and so I want to, off in media, and so I'm going to send my son to go get all the money and we'll be able to recover some of our losses and put our, our life together. And so he sends Tobias off to collect a debt. Tobias on the way encounters the angel Raphael. So this is where Raphael comes into the picture. Raphael has been sent by God, but he's in disguise. The two become traveling companions and they bring along the Tobias's dog. <laughs> And, and this is the only appearance that a positive dog makes in the, in the Bible, <laughs> in the Hebrew Bible. Normally, um, and so this is also showing that maybe they have a different sense about this in the diaspora at this time in the Second Temple period, but essentially dogs aren't portrayed as clean animals or Moses doesn't have a faithful dog, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, Tobias and Tobit have a dog. So anyway, they go to uh, the river Tigris, and while they're by the banks, uh, a magic fish jumps out, and uh, Raphael has... Uh, Tobias catch the, um, the fish real quick. Uh, then with the fish in hand, they arrive in media. Tobias meets uh, Sarah, who it turns out is his kinswoman. Um, and by the way, you know, he, one of the problems that they point out about people in diaspora Judaism is how do you marry somebody who is within the bloodlines? In other words, how do we not marry foreign uh, you know, women or whatever, which is what the Bible demands. And so this is a thing that Tobit's has told his son as he's going off on this journey, he's afraid that he's going to meet attractive foreign women, <laughs> you know, and this kind of thing. But fortunately, he marries uh, a kinswoman who he can marry, although there is a problem with marrying her, as we might remember. <laughs> so <laughs> he's number eight. So, but fortunately, he's got the magic fish, right? And so we'd already been told when he got the magic fish, the fish has um, internal organs that have three properties, the heart, liver, I'm sorry, the heart, yeah, liver, and gall, the heart and uh, liver can be used to dispel demons. And the gall is useful for, guess what? Curing blindness. Curing blindness. <laughs> so anyway, so it's a very important magic fish. So he uses the heart and the liver. He, makes a, he burns them and, and, and causes an odor. And so Asmodeus instantly flees to the further portions of Egypt. And that's the end of him. Meanwhile, then, so, uh, Tobias and Sarah get the debt. And they all make their way back to Nineveh to beat Tobit. Is the dog in the picture there? Yes. No. Yeah, there he is. So yeah, there's a lot of, the, the dog makes it into a lot of these paintings. <laughs> I think it's the only biblical dog. So, okay. Uh, returning home with the money and the fiance, Tobias meets the blind father. And um, as the angel had instructed him, he uses then the gall from the magic fish, rubs it on his father's eyes, takes off the cataracts essentially, and uh, cures his blindness. And so then they marry, Tobit blesses, his God, blesses God, uh, he lives happily ever after, and he and his wife die and are able to be buried with honor and everything, you know, that's as much as he could have ever wanted. So it is essentially the Job story, but with a big happy ending, you know, for, for Tobit. So um, describes then um, these concerns and beliefs of observant Jews in the diaspora in this kind of Second Temple period. But we can also notice as we're kind of reading this adventure, it's a little novella really, because it's actually kind of a fun, exciting story. It focuses on things like angels. So I mentioned that there really aren't that many named angels so far in the Old Testament. 
uh, Michael, I think, is all we got up until this point. Um, Gabriel is, is Gabriel's only in the New Testament, right? I, mean, I think so. So anything is Michael, and now we're getting Raphael. Yes? Um, so if a lot of the um, angels and other semi-divine characters are coming from the old sort of um, polytheistic origins, you'd, you'd expect to see more of them in the early scriptures, no? So there's angels, but they don't get names. <laughs> and so possibly the reason why their names are getting deleted is because they're not really angels in the, um, in the oldest part of the story, right? So they're, they're the sons of El, which is to say the other gods in the heavenly court. But as they're being demoted to angels, I think they're not getting these kind of names that we come from more familiar with. And so now these are really angel figures. So when they're being written this way, it's meant as an angel. And so that's a new kind of a thing that's uh, emerging. Uh, same thing, demons, exorcism, healing. You can kind of see exorcisms and healing and angels and demons, that this is really getting into the Second Temple worldview that Jesus is emerging out of, right? Because it's much more at the core of the concerns of what the New Testament authors are writing about than anything that's in what ends up being the, um, by, because the Jewish canon pulls back and gets rid of this, it actually gets rid of most of these developments, right? Because the only book that kind of makes it in is Daniel. Has nothing to do with anything, but uh, Tobias Tov means good. Oh, Tobias means good. Yeah. As in Mazel Tov, which means good luck. Yeah. Oh, there's a question here. <coughs> okay, so how did he escape the death curse with the fish? It saved him? Oh, yeah. So, so the fish had magic properties. <laughs> And so uh, in the one, obviously, was the gall. If you put the gall in the eyes, it'll make, it cures blindness. But the other were the liver and the heart. If you, I think you burn them in an incense thing. And the, and the smoke, uh, you know, in the same way that a, a sacrifice would be what God is pleased by, you know, when you, uh, when you do a sacrifice and do a, a burnt offering, and then, the, you know, God <coughs> smells the, it as a sweet savory or something like that. And in this case, the demons don't like this. <laughs> So this has probably caused a very bad fish smell, <laughs> you know, but especially as far as demons are concerned. And so the guy flees to, the demon flees all the way to the hithermost regions of Egypt, it says. So like at the very other side of the world as far as the author of Tobit's concerned. Okay. All right, so next, that's Tobit. <laughs> We're gonna do a couple more of these. <laughs> so, okay, next, additions to Daniel. <laughs> so um, this is not another whole book but it is little pieces of a book. So what we have is the earlier version, this, this is gonna be starting to be a theme that we have when we're looking at ancient texts. A lot of times ancient texts, and the way we have them presently, are not something that one person sat down and wrote, but rather um, somebody wrote, then somebody had that text, you know, in the same way you'd ever make a copy of it, while you're making a copy, people might take something else that's another text that's like it and put it with that text. <laughs> And sometimes when they do it, they might smooth it out in between, or sometimes it's deliberately done by a, an editor or what's called a redactor who is trying to do that and make two books into one book and making it coherent because they like both the books and they wish they were together as one book you know, in a new collection. Or uh, the original book is, is inspiring the person to um, want to write a much longer version of the book, and so they take the little book and they have made it longer. Or the original book offends them so much <laughs> that they want to fix it and they want to get rid of parts of it and make changes and that sort of thing. So that is continuously happening with these kind of texts. And so with Daniel here, what we end up having is we get to see it in action uh, because we have the text that it has existed as of 165 BCE, and that is the text essentially that's in the um, Hebrew Bible, although already it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic, so it may well be since it's even in two different languages, it may well be a bunch of different texts that have been stuck together because they're not even all in the same language as if you get to 165 BCE. And Isn't then we see these extra four parts and they are added by 100 BCE and that goes to become the Septuagint. Yeah, it says there that may be centuries older, you mean newer than Daniel. Oh, no. oh, they, oh, the new parts may be older than the original <laughs> right. Daniel. So this is, yeah, I'm sorry. But so the book of the Daniel slide is really was written weird. way yeah. after the actual... So yeah, so the book of Daniel is written 400 years after it supposedly took place, or rather it's composed into the present forms that we have it. So it's composed into 165 into the, this is the Hebrew and Aramaic version, 
and then the 100, 100 BCE in the, in, the, in the Greek version. But the pieces, some of the pieces were written right then. So some of the pieces we know were written then, but some of the pieces might have been older, but none of them are as old as this. But the parts that get stuck in in the Greek version are very likely older than the last parts of the uh, here. So it's a big mess, right? But essentially what they're doing here in this case is uh, the author who's putting the Septuagint versions together with these extra pieces, essentially they are finding free-floating stories that they like and they are inserting them into Daniel because it may well be a free-floating story about Daniel and they're like, well, why isn't this in the book of Daniel? And so then they put it in there. <laughs> it, they could also have made it up, but in this case, it's probably older. <laughs> and so in this case, uh, they found a free-floating story. <laughs> and there are those too. And so we'll, we'll mention one of these free-floating stories that's fairly, oh, so this is an example. I, anyway, how it worked. Essentially, we had Daniel as of 165 BC. There were these free-floating scrolls, so two prayers that are kind of like psalms, a little story about, called Susanna, another story called the idol bell and the dragon. There's actually two little stories that are kind of the same put together there. And so at a certain point, those are stuck together in Daniel, and that's then translated into Greek, and that gives us our Septuagint version. <laughs> Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I had realized that the story of Susanna was part of the book of Daniel. Does Daniel turn up as the judge uh, or as the, um, the advocate who interrogates the two witnesses and asks what kind of a tree this yeah. young man was in and they see different kinds of trees and so he says, you're both lying. That's right. Yep. You know the story. Yeah. So even though, so you know a story that isn't in the <laughs> you know, it's therefore I don't think it's in the the, the Hebrew Tanakh, <laughs> but it might be in the might be a story known by the rabbis. I don't know, so it could be someplace else. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to give another example that we've had before. So this is of the um, a couple centuries, about a century after. This is the how the the a theoretical way of the Gospel of John, as we have it in the New Testament, might have come together. So there might have been an original little, little gospel called the Signs Gospel that shows seven signs why Jesus is the Messiah. So seven different miracles. He turned water into wine. He raised Lazarus. And so this is the seventh sign or whatever that Jesus is the Messiah. Then there was a writer who is called by scholars, John 1, who maybe wrote the bulk of the Gospel of John, who expanded that little story and split it up and made a big whole gospel narrative text. Then there's another guy who scholars call John 2, uh, who was a redactor who didn't like John 1's theology and who edited it and changed it and then who wrote a big ending on the end that's his own. And so we can tell very clearly between John 1 and John 2 that there are two authors because the story ends and the new guy picks up and the, the seam is very um, poor. It's a very obvious seam because John 2 is way less sophisticated a writer than John 1. We don't know about this. This is totally theoretical. That's not for sure. This is, but it could be. Meanwhile, though, there is a story that's quite famous uh, about Jesus. It's called the woman taken in adultery. It's this woman who all of the people are wanting to uh, stone. And Jesus is doing this thing where he's writing on the ground. And, and ultimately, he says, uh, those of you without sin, cast the, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And all of the accusers uh, leave because they all know that they're sinful. Uh, and then, and so then he asked, women, "Woman, where is your accusers?" You know, and so, and so, in other words, she's then. Um, anyway, this is a, a, a story that I think almost all Christians really like, as encapsulating uh, Jesus's teachings and ministry. It is completely not in any of the early manuscripts of. <laughs> of John, so it is not part of the gospel originally. It's free-floating. Sometimes in some of the manuscripts it's found in Luke. So it is one of these free-floating stories. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen or whatever, or what, we don't know how early it is, but essentially it is not meant to be where it is in the gospel and it got stuck in there. And so that kind of thing has happened here with, with Daniel, right? Let's, let's soldier on. You have a, is it a quick comment or? Yes, um, I heard before on the radio that uh, you're commenting about the four Gospels. They said that John's Gospel was completely different from the other three. That's right. The other three were very similar, but John's was completely different. So maybe it's due to this situation with the John 1, John 2. Um, 
Yeah, it will, we've had a, we'll have to have another whole lecture to explain it. It's not why. <laughs> um, but yes, you're completely correct. The, the Gospel of John is totally different from the other three. Uh, the short answer is that um, Mark is the earliest Gospel, and both Luke and Matthew have Mark, and they both write their Gospels by editing Mark. And so they are each doing the same thing where they're expanding it out, they're using Mark, and then they're using one other source that they both share, which is called Q. Anyway, so they have both Mark and Q, and that's why Mark, Matthew, and Luke seem the same, because they're based on the same original text, Mark. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so the story of Susanna, to what Elizabeth was talking about. So we'll just read a little of this text so we get a sense of it. There was a man living in Babylon whose name was Joachim. He married uh, the daughter of Hilkiah, named Susanna, a very beautiful woman, of course. <laughs> you know, always, they're always very beautiful women been one who feared the Lord, so she's also very righteous. Susanna would go into her husband's garden to walk every day. The two elders, two Jewish elders, used to go in and see her going in and walking about, and they began to lust for her. One day they said to each other, let's go home, for it's time to go lunch. So they both left, and they went different ways but from each other. Then turning back, they met again, like, ooh, oh, I thought you were going home. I'm, uh, what am I doing here? Well, I don't, you know, anyway, so they both, <laughs> when they pressed each other as why they had both shown up and why they were kept on loitering, they admitted that they were, you know, each lusting in their hearts after Susanna, and so then they made a pact <laughs> or a conspiracy. They were going to arrange for a time when they could um, uh, have a nefarious pact. <laughs> so once, while they were watching and waiting for an opportune day, she, Susanna, went in as before with only two maids and wished to bathe in the garden, for it was a hot day. Uh, no one was there except the two elders who had hidden themselves and were watching her. When the maids had gone out, the two elders got up and ran to her. They said, look, the garden doors are shut and no one can see us. We are burning with desire for you. These guys are, they really know how to um, woo, woo a gal here, right? <laughs> we're burning with desire for you, so give your consent and lie with us. But if you refuse, we will testify against you that a young man was with you and that this is why you sent your maids away. So she's going to get uh, a false, uh, false accusation by two elders if, if the, uh, of adultery if, uh, if she refuses. Susanna groaned and said, <laughs> I am completely trapped, for if I do this, it will mean death for me. If I do not, I cannot escape your hands. I, can, I choose not to do it. I will fall into your hands rather than sin in the sight of the Lord. Then Susanna cried out with a loud voice, so good for her. And then the two elders also then shouted out against her, so they're going to um, follow through with their threat. The elders then go on to testify against Susanna. The people all run, and they all decide that they're going to stone her on the word of these elders uh, until Daniel, as Elizabeth points out, comes in as the judge and cries foul. He uh, gets them each separated, and so this is the first kind of detective story in, in uh the Bible anyway, but in maybe in history, so that each one of them is put in their own room and he questions each one of them about what tree was it and all this other kind of things. They teach, to, they, they, they tell different stories because they didn't make up, it, they didn't make the story up in this kind of detail. And so as a result of it, their testimonies don't match. Caught in their lies, then they're stoned for giving false testimony. Okay, that's a fun story, <laughs> good story, <laughs> happy ending story. So the same thing, Daniel and the idol Bell, it's another one of these fun stories. So uh, Daniel uh, was a companion of the king, Cyrus of Persia. He was one of the most honored of all his friends. Now the Babylonians had an idol called Bel, and every day they provided for it 12 bushels of choice flour and 40 sheep and 60, six measures of wine. The king revered it, he revered the idol, and he went every day to worship it, but Daniel, Daniel worshiped his own god. So the king said to him, why do you not worship Bel? Daniel answered, because I do not revere idols made with hands, but the living God who created heaven and earth and has dominion over all living creatures. So this is a, um, a polemical morality tale against uh, pag po po paganism. <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, essentially against polytheism and use of images in, in worship. The king said to him, do you not think that Bel is a living God? Do you not see how much food he eats and drinks every day? Daniel laughed and says, do not be deceived, O king, for this thing is only clay inside and bronze outside, and it never ate or drank anything. So the king was angry, and he called the priests of Bel and said to them, if you do not tell me who is eating the provisions, you shall die. <laughs> but if you prove that Bel is eating them, Daniel shall die, because he has spoken blasphemy against Bel. <laughs> so Daniel said to the king, let it be done as you've said. <laughs> 
So setting him up for, <laughs> for mm -hmm. don't want to be in the priest's shoes here. So, but the food is sealed then inside the temple. So they close it, the doors so that nobody can get in out and they put the seals on the doors, but the 70 priests have a secret entrance. <laughs> And so they come in and the secret entrance which they use, they have a big party, they drink all the wine, they eat all the food. But Daniel, oh, so anyway, they come out, Daniel, the food is all gone and Daniel is set to be killed. But previously he had set his servants there and they put ash and dust all over the ground. And so when they go in, Dan, point, Daniel points out all of these footprints of all the 70 priests. And he says, now what, what, what the hell, what's going on there? You know, <laughs> something like that. And so then Cyrus realizes the priests trick him. And so Cyrus puts the priests and their whole families to death, <laughs> just for good measure. No, they should have. They should have thought of that. <laughs> and it's probably dark in there. <laughs> so anyway, then Daniel then is given control of the idol on the temple, which he then promptly destroys. So you can kind of see the kind of uh, free-floating stories that were obviously very. Um, energetic and precious to people and so they wanted to put those into the rest of the canon you can kind of see how these make their way into into a compilation like Daniel okay so now we'll go to Maccabees we'll look at a different kind of story this one is one that is meant as more of a history um, its setting <coughs> is in the second century BCE and is composed a little bit after that so it's actually not um, uh, pseudonym pseudonymous or pretending to be what it's not, the way um, some of the previous ones have been. Uh, and rather, it's giving us pretty much insight into this particular time period. And so even though it's not scripture uh, for, for example, Judaism, it's very important for Jewish historians who are reconstructing what happened at this time. So the author is unknown, but probably in Judea itself. There are a bunch of other Maccabees books, as we saw. They are unrelated to this book. And in fact, they, um, so even though they're called 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Maccabees, it's mostly just we have lots of Maccabee books, and they've just numbered them based on which one they got first or whatever in terms of the canon. But they, um, they in fact, even in some cases, contradict the first one. <laughs> and so the authors have different viewpoints. So this is a, a history, then, of the Hasmonean Revolt. And so we talked about how uh, at the end of the um, Hellenistic period, after, uh, after Ptolemy, after Egypt was controlling um, Judea, then uh, we saw that the Syrians were controlling, uh, the Greek Syrians are controlling uh, uh, Judea, and then um, the, there's a revolt, and there's an independent kingdom under the Hasmoneans. So here's the plot of First Maccabees. The Hellenistic king Antiochus IV of Syria uh, conquers Jerusalem and seizes it away from the Ptolemies in Egypt. Um, he then sets up what's called an abomination of desolation in the temple, which is to say um, an idol uh, or a symbol of idols, you know. Um, the, so, and so anyway, an idol in the temple. And the idea of it, the, the, important, the importance of this word here, abomination of desolation, is that this is also um, the word that is used in Daniel's Apocalypse, uh, of a prediction of something that's going to happen. And later apocalyptic readers read Daniel and they assume this to mean something in the far future often. And this is also how it's reinterpreted through the book of Revelations and things like that. But it's very clear what Daniel means is the same exact incident. So he's referring to Antiochus IV. And it's also written, that we can, that's one of the reasons why we can tell it's, uh, that the book of Daniel is written shortly after this event happens because it's very concerned with this event. So uh, he attempts then to force the Judeans to adopt all of these Hellenistic practices. So all around, um, you know, for the last couple hundred years here, um, uh, people who are Lydian speaking, people who are Carian speaking, Cappadocian speaking, all of the different peoples um, have started to learn Greek, Aramaic speaking, Phoenicians, everybody have started to learn Greek. They have started to adopt Greek customs. They're listening to Greek philosophy, and they are having, um, they are, for example, having Greek uh, schools and cities. And so, for example, the gymnasium, where, um, which is the nude school for uh, young aristocratic boys and things like that. And so they are refounding all these cities as Greek cities. Um, and so now, um, Antiochus here is more or less saying. We're not making any exceptions for Judeans anymore. You have to stop being, you know, you have to stop all of this kind of um, nonconformity and get with the program that everybody has with, the, you know, the Greek future here. Um, and so there is a reaction against that. Uh, a guy named Metatias and 
a bunch of his sons, including a guy named Judah Maccabee, um, have a revolt against uh, the Syrians. Um, and also it's a civil war because there's a giant faction. We can always remember that also are already Hellenizing, so they, that they're actually a whole bunch of uh, Jewish people who are on board with this. In other words, we do want to get with the program. We want to modernize. You know, so, so there is also kind of a civil war between the, those kind of two factions. So um, in 165 BCE, the temple is freed uh, and reconsecrated so that sacrifices may begin again. And this is um, emerging out of this is the Hanukkah story. And so the Hel Hel festival of Hanukkah is instituted by uh, Judas Maccabeus and his brothers, the Hasmoneans, who become the priests and later the princes or the kings of an independent Hasmonean Judean kingdom. Uh, it's a controversial uh, rule that they have because they are not from either the, the priestly line. So you might remember that people have to be descended from Aaron in order to be the high priest via Zadok. So you have to be a Zadokite or a Sadducee. And so the Hasmoneans initially aren't part of that bloodline, although they merge into this um, overall nobility. Um, and likewise, then, to be king, you're supposed to be Davidic. So you're supposed to be from the house of David, and there are neither of those things. And so their rule, in some senses, is also then controversial. And once they are in charge, they also, a lot of them, there's a, um, they can't help but want to Hellenize a little bit either. <laughs> and so what ends up happening is that they'll sometimes have then um, Greek names. They want to bring in some of the customs that are in all of their neighboring kingdoms because there's no other model of how to be king of anywhere than all of the neighboring Hellenistic kingdoms. And so they start bringing all those kind of things in. And then also <coughs> they end up, in order to maintain their independence from much larger kingdoms around them, they end up cutting deals with the emerging Roman Republic, which is emerging as the Mediterranean's great power. And um, even though the Romans always, always, always claim that they only ever fought defensive wars and they never, you know, were intervening to take anything over. Anytime you make a deal with the Romans, you know, you're only able to be independent for a very short period of time. And so essentially very quickly it becomes a client kingdom and then a client, the Hasmoneans get replaced ultimately by Herod, who is a relative in terms of by marriage, but anyway ends up being the king. That, by the way, is uh, it's a menorah. It is not a Hanukkah. It's not a Hanukkah menorah. Okay. It's got seven right. candles, not nine. Oh, good point. Yeah, well, this is the menorah from the, yeah. from the temple. So this is the one that, because um, this is from the Arch of Titus. So this is the Roman, actually the Roman uh, celebration of spoiling the, and destroying the temple. Thank you. Okay, so essentially Maccabees. So the idea of this is, um, it reveals for us a lot of the context of the Second Temple period and also this internal conflict that is happening, that this tension that we've had all the way back to the First Temple period of, of being drawn either towards Egypt or drawn towards Babylonia, likewise now being drawn towards, again, um, well, Syria now on the one side and later now it's going to be a revived Persia. Uh, oh, and then on the other side, um, Egypt has now fallen to the Greeks, so essentially the Greek-speaking world and the Romans. <clears throat> okay, Ecclesiasticus. Um, this is, I, I think that once you already have a book called Ecclesiastes, having one called Ecclesiasticus, <laughs> you know, it starts to become very confusing for anybody. So often this one's called Sirach, uh, although it's not written by a guy named Sirach, but it's written by a guy whose grandfather was named Sirach. So it's set um, sometime in this before the anyway, sec late second century or early second century BCE. Uh, and it's composed right around the same time because again, it's meant to be, this is also one of these ones that's not pseudonymous, right? So it is not a later writer who's writing in the name of Ezra or Enoch or any other person, but rather writing in his own name. Um, it's originally in Hebrew, translated into Greek. The Hebrew's lost, mostly lost, there's fragments. It's written by a guy named Jesus, the son of Eleazar, the son of Sirach, which uh, in Aramaic would be, or I'm sorry, Hebrew would be Yeshua ben El Elazar ben Sirah. And so he is a Jew living in Jerusalem at this time. Uh, his then grandson uh, translates it, in, updates it, translates, writes a little introduction, translates it into Greek, and it makes it into the Septuagint that way. And so we have in the past, um, I think when we were talking about the book of Job, we looked a little bit about the wisdom tradition. Um, we don't talk as much about it anymore, but anyway, that's also an important component of the um, 
Hebrew Bible, uh, the Old Testament. And so we looked at it before how there's essentially two different kinds of wisdom literature and the two are in fairly stark disagreement with each other. <laughs> And so they're, um, this is normal for philosophers, right? So the wisdom literature is more like philosophy and the philosophers tend to have like one position and then the other ones have a different position, right? And so we have that in Greek philosophy as well. So it starts in the earliest one in this kind of philosophy that's called prudential wisdom. And these are things like the Proverbs, which is essentially um, things that people say that are like common sense truths. Uh, and so that's essentially what prudential wisdom is. If you um, if you do everything right, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. If you put up money in the bank, you'll, you know, you, you, if you, you know, it'll be, you'll be happy for it tomorrow and not all this kind of thing. So all of this kind of good behavior or wise behavior leads to good results kind of thing. But then there is a, after, a, after several centuries of that, um, there is a new wisdom that emerges that's called reflective wisdom, which is wisdom that we, we read about, for example, in Job, it's quite famously, um, Job was really wise. Job was really righteous. He did all these righteous things, uh, and he was totally innocent according to the book, and yet he gets punished and has the, all the most horrible things that happen to you that could possibly happen to you. And so the reflective wisdom asks, well, why is that be? <laughs> that's kind of what, not what you said in Proverbs. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the opposite of what you said would happen in Proverbs. And yet we find this kind of thing happening all the time, where we see, wow, there's a really wicked guy who he, maybe he's a billionaire and he maybe then wins stuff like elections <laughs> and I don't know. And you wonder why would that keep happening? That doesn't make any sense if Proverbs tells us anything. You know, you, you know that person is thrown into the pit, uh, supposedly. Anyway, so the reflective wisdom of Job and then Ecclesiastes then um, are arguing then uh, that this is not what we see happening. But this is, gets pretty harsh. So Ecclesiastes at a certain point is kind of even wondering and makes the argument several times that the only thing that a person can have then is to take pleasure in their life, their work, uh, to eat and to drink and to, uh, and to be prosperous around them because at some point or other we're all going to die and everything else that you do is totally vanity and vain and, that, and we can't even tell if a human spirit goes to heaven and a dog goes into, uh, uh, into the shoal or if no one goes anywhere because there's no spirits and there's no afterlife. So Ecclesiastes gets pretty bleak. <laughs> And the reflective uh, wisdom tradition is sort of, um, anyway, uh, people want to push back on that too, you know, and so they would rather have, they would rather have no, do good and good things will result. And so there ends up being then in the Apocrypha books like Sirach, Ecclesiasticus, and Wisdom of Solomon that are written later that you're essentially pulling back to the prudential kind of wisdom, uh, updating it for the Hellenistic time periods here and uh, countering then the reflective wisdom. And so for example, um, Proverbs, if we go back to this first one in terms of this kind of prudential wisdom, these are kind of promises that we get in Proverbs, so uh, concerning wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom. And this is wisdom speaking. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for long life and abundant welfare they will give you. So if you are following the precepts of wisdom, if you were doing, following the Proverbs, you'll have uh, abundant welfare and long life. Blessed are those who find wisdom. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. So wisdom holds those two things for you if you follow all the kind of proverb teachings. So that's what the kind of the results of Proverbs. But as we've seen then from the reflective wisdom of Ecclesiastes and Job, we have things, Ecclesiastes says, I've seen it all from the righteous perishing in their righteousness to the wicked growing old in their wickedness. <laughs> so if that keeps happening, Proverbs and wisdom, prudential wisdom is wrong as far as Ecclesiastes wisdom is concerned. Likewise in Job, Job says, it is all one. Therefore I say, God destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks, mocks the calamity of the innocent. So it's a very harsh <laughs> statement um, uh, coming from the Hebrew Bible, <laughs> you know, uh, about God. And so actually a lot of people, therefore, wanted to soften that and to push back against that. And in fact, they rewrote Job about 20 times to try to, try to soften that. <laughs> so one of the ways then is Sirach here. Uh, he writes then, wisdom was first of all created things. She built an everlasting home among the mortals 
with her descendants, she will keep faith. So again, holy wisdom here personified. Uh, if you are following all these wise precepts, wisdom is going to keep faith with you. Um, there is a very neat um, theory that I read in an article by uh, Randall McGraw-Helms, who's one of my favorite um, New Testament scholars, who argues uh, that Jesus of Q, so the sayings gospel, the gospel that uh, Luke and Matthew both used to construct their um, gospels, was familiar with uh, the prudential wisdom of Sirach here. The guy Sirach is named Jesus Ben, uh, whatever, Ben Sirach. <laughs> and he teaches in direct opposition. So the two Jesuses are against each other in terms of this. The Jesus of Nazareth, that he argues, is clearly aware of this, be, aware of this text because there's a dozen, dozen places where he takes the same text and turns it upside down. And some of it is pretty cool word for word. I'm not going to pull all those out, but there's some of these that are, are some of the, where we can at least see the teachings are opposite. So Sirach says, the most high hates sinners. Never help a sinner. Never trust your enemy. Don't have him at your side or he will trip you up. So that's pretty prudential prove, you know, Proverbs kind of thing. If you, if you, if you trust your enemies, you're, you know, that's, going to be, that's going to end bad for you. Jesus, though, says, love your enemies. Do the good for those who hate you. Pray for those who treat you spitefully. Right? So it's the opposite kind of wisdom. Likewise, um, Jesus, the son, um, I'm sorry, Jesus, son of Sirach, lists a, grandson of Sirach, lists a number of people and activities that are blessed. So blessed are the this, blessed are that, and woe to you this. Jesus of Nazareth takes those same things and, and flips them the opposite. So Sirach, who's writing earlier, says, you who fear the Lord, expect prosperity, lasting happiness, and favor. So if you are following all these precepts and fearing God and following Proverbs, you're going to expect prosperity, lasting happiness, and favors. Blessed is the rich that is found without blemish. Wealth is good. <laughs> so, yes, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That sounds like such a psychologically and maybe sociologically like such a right versus left politically <laughs> argument that I'm wondering if, you know, at that time, I, I, was it the Sadducees were more kind of representative of the prosperous or uh, was there some kind of political division that that might have so been he's representative of? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question, right? So what is the, what, what these guys do are arguing, right, with each other? Um, so Sirach here is coming out of the, he calls himself a scribe, so he's coming out of the scribal class, and so that would mean that he would be more likely aligned with where a Pharisee is at than a Sadducee. Sadducees tend to, okay, yeah, the Sadducees who are the real super elite priests, they tend to not care about all of this babbly writing stuff, and they more or less say, we care only about the Torah and everything else that's not in it. You know, you guys can argue about all you want because what the Torah says is that you have to, that the only people that can do the that can do sacrifice is the most important thing. The temple is the most important thing. The only people that can do sacrifice are the Sadducees, and all this other stuff is just nonsense. There may not there, we're not we don't believe in resurrections. We don't believe in all this kind of things. What's important is you know the temple, and that's and who's supposed to conduct it. So the Sadducees are kind of fixed on that, I think. So anyway, yes. So probably coming out of you know, the, you know, this Pharisee tradition, although not all the Pharisees would agree with Sirach, it doesn't, it, he is quoted by the, the rabbis. I think he's not making it, as I mentioned, into the Jewish canon. Uh, and so um, Jesus is an, also sets himself up in the Gospels anyway as an opponent of the Pharisees on a bunch of different things. So he's against scribes in general. Um, and he clearly has a, one of these different alternatives anyway of the wisdom tradition. He talks about wisdom in the Gospels too. But what I would kind of argue is that there's already a back and forth in this wisdom tradition and that Jesus is probably fitting just in this green side as opposed to the purple side of these two things within the broader tradition. So he might just be considered his own scribe or Pharisee himself, part of this wisdom tradition, but on the other side. So... Um, already had those. Wealth is good. So Jesus is side of that, you know, uh, besides blessed are the rich. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So those are uh, from the Jesus side of that. And again, um, Jesus, the son of Sirach here, uh, says that, quote, a devout man lends to his neighbors, but if the guy who he borrowed from, if he cannot repay, he has defrauded the other of his money and gratuitously made an enemy of him, he will pay him back in curses and insults. 
Uh, and so Jesus writes or says, if you lend only where you expect to be repaid, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to each other to be repaid in full. So essentially, um, for Jesus of Nazareth, Sirach's devout man is only a sinner, right? And so there's probably a deliberate reversal of all of these things. So anyway, I think it's just an interesting that this text, while it doesn't make it into um, and most of the canons, may well have been you know, and known and influential to early Christians and, and maybe something that they're reacting against even. Always things don't necessarily come out of the ether. Almost every time you have a, an, a text and you think, oh, that's really original, it may well be that they're writing the opposite of something that they're reacting against, you know? Okay, so we're just gonna do one more of these because we're really getting, it's running long here. So the second book of Esdras, which is actually also sometimes called fourth <laughs> Esdras. And so the problem here is that Esdras is the Greek for Ezra and, um, and there's already a book of Ezra in the, uh, in the Protestant Old Testament. And in fact, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are first and second Ezra in the um, Septuagint. And so then this becomes the fourth one because there's <laughs> another one, first Ezra. So anyway, it's very confusing because actually different people name them all different things. So it's actually alternatively known as second Ezra, third Ezra, or fourth Ezra, depending on what, what book you're in. So it's set in Ezra's life. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, so it should be earlier than that. Um, I, I, I didn't change it from the last one. So anyway, <laughs> it should go back to the setting. The slide here is wrong. It should say essentially right after the, um, after the rebuilding of the temple in Ezra's life. It's composed, though, of three separate texts that are composed in the first through third centuries of the Common Era. So now we're actually on the other side of the, the meridian here. And so these are much more recent, and I just kind of am pointing these out to show that this kind of activity does not actually end. So, like I say, there become more and more doorkeepers that are keeping these texts from being in anybody's canon, but people have not stopped writing scripture. It continues in, in even the Christian tradition to, to the present. Um, uh, and so, anyway, these are written in initially, the earliest, earliest one is written in, um, the earliest text is written originally in Hebrew, it was translated into Greek. The later two may have actually, one of them may have even been composed in Latin, of all things, and then translated into Greek. Uh, but in any event, it's uh, uh, now only had in Greek. The author are unknown, the original, the early one is a Jewish author, and then the other two are Christian author editors. So. Uh, essentially, it's three books that are totally different from each other that have been stuck together. <laughs> and there's three different authors that are very distinct from each other. The oldest one is the one in the middle. <laughs> so uh, this kind of thing just happens. Okay, so writing as Ezra, the earliest of these authors, which is more confusingly called Ezra IV, <laughs> as if all of these other Ezra's, anyway, so there's just a lot of different, anyway, because the next one, the other ones are Ezra V and Ezra VI. Anyway, so Ezra IV, is a Jew lamenting the destruction of the second temple by the Romans by writing as though he were lamenting the destruction of the first temple by the Babylonians. And so um, it's essentially taking this new thing that's happened, the destruction of the, the second temple, um, and then putting it into that context of something that had happened before. Ezra 4 then goes on to tell an apocalyptic vision of the world's present wrongs and that how those are gonna be overturned. And so this is one of the things that has emerged uh, in this whole Second Temple period is more and more of the prophets are apocalyptic writers and it's essentially visions like in Daniel where you're essentially assuming there's going to be an end of the world, a cataclysm where the old world will be destroyed and the new world will be merged where the just are finally rewarded. So we'll just read a little bit of it. So you may remember that uh, in the earliest part of the Hebrew Bible um, there's a sense that uh, you know, when why do the righteous suffer? There's collective punishment when the people are unrighteous, when they break God's laws, when they become pagans. God then um, brings uh, destroyers in to just, you know, mess the people up, and then they eventually remember, oh yeah, you were supposed to be only worshiping the Lord. <laughs> and so then they repent, and then the Lord brings a judge, and the judge kicks out all of the foreigners, the Midianites, or anything like that. And so that's the cycle as taught about why that kind of thing happens in the first temple period in the oldest part of the Bible. Throughout the entire Second Temple period, nobody is being a pagan. <laughs> Everybody is, you know, they're becoming increasingly, you know, following the laws much more and more and more strictly. 
Um, they are pretty pretty solid on that, and so that is really not the problem that has happened. And so now, when the you know the Romans, for example, have destroyed the temple again, the answer is hard to fathom, and they have to come up with something new. So here's what Ezra, Ezra here has to say, or Ezra four has to say. Then I said in my heart, are the deeds of those who inhabit Babylon, and we can say in this case. Rome, <laughs> so, you know, who we're writing on behalf of, right? Are the deeds of those who inhabit Rome, are they any better? Is that why it has gained dominion over Zion, over Jerusalem? And my heart failed me because I have seen how you, God, endure those who sin and have spared those who act wickedly, have destroyed your people and protected your enemies, and have not shown to anyone how your way may be comprehended. <laughs> are the deeds of Babylon better than those of Zion? Or has another nation known you besides Israel? Of what tribes have so believed the covenants as these tribes of Jacob? We are really doing it. We're doing everything we can. <laughs> what are these Romans doing? Yet Israel's reward has not appeared, <coughs> and their labor has borne no fruit. For I have traveled widely among the nations, so among all the Gentiles, and I have seen that they abound in wealth. They're doing really good. <laughs> You know, though they, are, uh, though they are unmindful of your commandments. They're not doing anything they're supposed to and they're getting rewarded. Now therefore weigh in balance and a balance our iniquities and those of the inhabitants of the world and it will be found which way the scales will incline. When have the inhabitants of the earth not sinned in your sight or what nation has kept your commandments so well? <laughs> So, you know, if we were to believe, you know, this thing that the wicked are going to get punished and the righteous are going to get rewarded, you know, that clearly hasn't happened as of 70, 70 AD. And so from, from this um, present calamity, this then, um, uh, uh, this, this particular Ezra uh, um, has a literary vision with the archangel Uriel. And so this adds our fourth archangel. So Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel. And uh, the archangel Uriel um, essentially shows an apocalyptic vision of how, you know, in the end times, you know, the, the wicked will ultimately be punished and scourged and all kinds of things and the righteous will be rewarded. And so it's a, a, a new idea now um, that reward is not going to happen in this life because we're seeing that it's not happening. So, so just to sum up, <laughs> it's a big, long, a lot of detail and things like that and I hope it's been enjoyable. Um, there is this entire period um, that isn't represented, uh, especially in the Protestant and Jewish canons, but it didn't mean that pro prophecy or writing stopped. Um, and when we actually then look at these texts that have uh, come down to us, um, it's interesting because they do give us a stronger picture of how Christianity emerged, the kinds of um, immediate context, the kinds of things that early Christians were thinking about, and also how rabbinic Judaism emerged, the things that the rabbis are immediately dealing with, like the destruction of the temple. So, thank you. Yeah, question. Thank you. It was most interesting, thank you very much. Uh, my question is with regard to Martin Luther King. Were there any of the uh, books that were left out that he believed in or didn't believe in, or what was his uh, thoughts on these books, some that were so, in the so Catholic? So Mar Martin Luther or Martin Luther King, Jr.? No, no, Martin Luther, pardon. Martin Luther, okay. Because <laughs> I don't know as much about Martin Luther King, Jr., what he was maybe thought about in oh. individual book, but I can tell you about Martin Luther. That's so Martin right. Luther um, was definitely uh, on the board with getting rid of the Apocrypha. Oh, and okay. Yeah, so he didn't like the Apocrypha. He felt that this was um, people, uh, he had all kinds of different ways where he had decided that um, essentially the Roman church had introduced uh, errors into the true early Christianity that they wanted to, he wanted to purge away. So anything that was like Christian tradition, that was seen as being paganizing tendencies and things like that. And so these texts he thought we can just go ahead and get rid of. And he actually had a bunch of different more texts that he wanted to get rid of too, but it was, uh, People didn't agree. <laughs> so anyway, they, they wanted to lose some more. So he did like, because on, sorry, on, on the board there, it said the Protestants had a certain number of the- But just in the appendix. Books. So they just all got the ripped appendix. out of the main books and put into the appendix. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, so, and so they're on there as an appendix because, because they're translated, because Anglicans never, so that, you know, when we're talking about the English speaking world, as opposed to the German world, Anglicans 
um, always tried to steer this kind of mushy middle path, right, where they didn't want to get rid of the bishops, and they didn't want to get rid of all the liturgy and the robes and all the fun stuff like that, but then they did get rid of the, some of the statues and this kind of thing. And, you know, but they, so they put, the, they put all those books and they put them in the appendix. So we didn't throw them away, but um, we still printed them, you know, and so that kind of thing. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, you just answered one question, which is um, that uh, uh, the Apocrypha may not have been in, they were apocryphal, but they were there. Uh, and so they were uh, accessible to German Christians because uh, there's a bit from the Wisdom, I think, and there's a bit from Ecclesiasticus that uh, is part of the um, Brahms Requiem. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's very influ influential, conti continuing to be influential in, in, in Renaissance Reformation art. Mm. So there is all of these. I didn't have any problem finding pictures from, oh, from these no. books in terms of paintings, and also we wouldn't have trouble finding it in music. There's an opera on Susanna, American. Yeah. Uh, there's an opera by Verdi called Stefelio about a um, Christian minister who is called upon to forgive his unfaithful wife. I can't remember how it ends. Uh, and the other thing that comes to mind is that when, when we say something is apocryphal, um, it means, it usually means, oh, there's this story about somebody. Right, yeah. It may or may not be true, but <laughs> it's a good story and it speaks to the essence of the person it's about. Good point. Yeah, that's a great way, to, a great way to kind of sum up how we have treated this. But like you say, it has continued to be, um, it was continued then to be used and influential in the art. And in fact, um, it turns out that Renaissance painters really liked painting the Susanna story, as you might imagine. And I only was able to find the one that wasn't really an indecent picture you know, <laughs> that I put in. So I, I had to look around for the right painting to put in the slide, but anyway. <laughs> so. Yeah. And the, um, others, and the others she was naked. Yeah, of course, but I mean, it's also these l very lecherous oh. elders, right? So, <laughs> so anyway. They didn't get anywhere in the first place. That's why they were so lecherous. They didn't get anywhere. They, didn't, they obviously deserved what they got. <laughs> yeah, they were young guys. They weren't young. No. Oh, when they, they were, were young. Oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Valerie. Yeah, just before you ended the lecture, what was it, second Ezra, or, or you, had, you had something up uh, just before... Uh, no, for right, right before the, the next to last sli slide, I believe. This one. Or, or just before that. Yeah, um, why did the righteous suffer? The, um, and you said that um, at the time that there was a shift towards seeing the reward in the afterlife because I, how yeah. else could it be that you, know, you try and try and you do everything right and yet the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer and Israel isn't doing very well. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that kind of general sentiment, let's say it was kind of a, re maybe call, call it a reformist sentiment, uh, you know, to see, uh, you know, to recast the, you know, the fruits of one's, you know, one's uh, righteous living into an afterlife. Might it have also affected Jesus and his sayings? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, no, so this is definitely um, part of what's going on in early Christianity. So what, I, and what I'm kind of even saying here uh, is that this is kind of a, a very mainstream context of Second Temple Judaism. Um, it ultimately is something that the Christians then go with. And so, mm -hmm. it, and so because um, all of these Second Temple texts end up staying with Christianity until the Protestants you know, purged them out, semi, purged sort yeah, of. Yeah, because I was thinking end. that first and foremost, Jesus was a Jew, and yes. he would have thought, as a Jew did at the time, you know, of the Roman occupation and how dispiriting it was. And so I can yes. see, again, psychologically, the shift to seeing the reward in the afterlife, and then, then of course, becomes so important in Christianity. You're exactly right. And so, and so that's what's so interesting is that, again, this isn't something that <clears throat> is had or even understood. So this question here that, um, that Ezra, not real Ezra, but anyway, Ezra 4, you know, writing after the destruction of the Second Temple, he's looking back at the earliest part, the part of the canon that continues to be in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Jewish canon, and it doesn't describe this results. <laughs> you know, and so the results should be 
that Israel should have prospered and prospered and prospered and all the wicked should have been punished or something like that. But that didn't happen and so they, he's trying to come to terms with some new way to do it. And so this has been emerging through the entire Second Temple period. <clears throat> We've talked before uh, when we talked about resurrection, you know, that one of the places resurrection may be, the influence may be coming from Zoroastrianism, which has resurrection that has been the religion of the Persian Empire that has been therefore influencing, by this time that this is being written, has been influencing uh, Judaism for 600 years. Um, uh, coming out of this kind of, that, that kind of sense, because resurrection is less a Greek idea. So the Greeks are more, inter more believing. So whereas Zoroastrians do not have um, um, mind-body mind dualism where they're believing in a, they have a good-evil dualism, but matter is both good and evil, spirit is both good and evil, whereas for, um, uh, for Greeks, um, mind and body are very separate things, and flesh, and flesh tends to be the thing that gets to be made equal, evil, and, and spirit tends to be the thing that's good. And so Greeks don't come up with resurrection as an idea. They think of having a spiritualized existence that is immaterial. So that's generally, I mean, that's not all Greeks, but anyways, that's generally where, where people are coming from. And so anyway, an afterlife, that idea, it's something that the Christians really go with. Then in, in the, when the rabbis decide then to pr really purge out almost all of these Second Temple texts, as a result, this stuff doesn't really continue on as much in rabbinic Judaism. So even though rabbinic Judaism is coming out of this context, this kind of focus, apocalyptic focus, all this kind of thing, is way more muted than in the Jewish tradition, which goes back and focuses on the earlier texts by getting rid of these out of the canon. Well, all makes sense, huh? <laughs> so, okay. Well, very good. We thank everybody for joining us uh, online. And we remind you that our um, offerings in terms of online um, uh, offerings that we have. We can do more programming based on your generous contributions. You can always go to our website, centerplace, spelled the Canadian way, dot CA. Or, and, or the wrong way, too. Or the wrong way. <laughs> and uh, and your, your donations are very appreciated and they're tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada. Thanks so much.